Okay, um, thank you very much for coming. Can you hear me at the back? Yes, good. Uh, my name is Ben Caldicott. I'm director of the Sustainable Finance Program at the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment. Um, welcome to this event on the future of climate change and financial innovation <coughs> uh, with an important perspective by Frank Elderson, who's executive director of the Dutch Central Bank, PNB, who's going to be our keynote speaker today. Um, before introducing our keynote um, and his respondent, because he's a respondent today as well, I just wanted to say a few words about how we, we got here. Um, it's worth reflecting that the interest and relevance of central banks and financial regulators to climate change has not always been apparent, um, and the connection has only been made relatively recently. Um, uh, and the reason that central banks and financial regulators have become interested in environmental change and societal responses to environmental change, particularly physical climate change impacts and societal responses to those physical climate change impacts, um, are twofold, I think. Uh, and these were articulated by Mark Carney, the current governor of the Bank of England, in speeches he gave in September 2015 and, um, and another one in September 2016. Um, the first was at Lloyds of London, the second, one, the second was in Berlin in 2016. Um, and the first reason is that getting financial markets to integrate climate change and the environment into their decision making will help financial institutions better manage risk. Um, and that will help them reduce losses, will help them be solvent, and in aggregate will help the financial system be more resilient. So that's one, one reason for central bankers and regulators being interested in all of this. The second, um, and this is a sort of a theme that he picked up on in Berlin, was that this creates massive opportunities to address weak global growth and soak up the glut of global savings that exists around the world. Huge amounts of investment are required to deliver on um, the SDGs, on the Paris Climate Change Agreement, the transition that we're seeing is all about capital expenditure. It's a capex intensive transition. And that investment will increase productivity, it could increase global growth, um, and it will incre increase demand for capital. And as you know, interest rates are at rock bottom at the moment, and that demand for capital could increase interest rates, helping pension funds and other asset owners um, attempting to, to match their liabilities, or their assets with liabilities. Um, now, there's an awful lot to say about those two reasons, and we'll touch on some of that, I'm sure, over the course of the next hour and a bit. Um, but it's worth also saying that the Financial Stability Board has endorsed many of those arguments, particularly through the creation of a task force on climate-related financial disclosures that was chaired by Michael Bloomberg. It's also been endorsed by other central banks and financial regulators in Europe. The People's Bank of China have made similar arguments. The Australian Prudential Regulation Authority has certainly endorsed the, the risk side of those arguments. Um, and you have central banks in emerging economies and in some developing countries um, also endorsing those arguments and also thinking about how to integrate and actively integrating actually sustainability into their mandates. Bangladesh being an example of a developing country doing so, um, Brazil an example of an emerging economy doing so. And, and, um, and that's all uh, very gratifying actually and, um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, the, the, the main reason for me is that um, in early 2012 a bunch of us wrote a letter to um, the, the then governor of the Bank of England, Sir Mervyn King, saying, um, or making those arguments, that we thought that climate change would, was potentially <coughs> a systemic risk to the global, global financial system and that it required consideration by something called the Financial Policy Committee uh, of the Bank of England, which was set up in response to the global, global financial crisis, to, to look at long-term systemic risk to the financial system. And he wrote back very politely, um, saying that he was skeptical of those arguments and that there were three tests that the Bank of England would apply to examining whether there are any financial stability implications associated with, uh, with climate change and the sort of risks we were hypothesizing. Um, the first test was that exposures of financial institutions to carbon intensive sectors are large relative to overall assets. The second test was that the impact of policy and technology working to reduce returns in high carbon areas is not already being priced into the market, either through lower expected returns or higher risk premia discounting these returns. And thirdly, that any subsequent correction would take place over an insufficiently long period of time for the financial institutions to adjust their portfolios in an orderly manner. Um, and he concluded by saying, the necessity of all three conditions being met 
raises a question in our minds as to whether or not this is a potential threat to financial stability. So this was at the beginning of 2012. Um, and I think uh, it's a reflection on all the work and the research that people have been doing since then, um, including within central banks, um, like the Dutch Central Bank, um, that demonstrates now that we have uh, good reason to believe that these three tests have been met. Um, exposures relative to um, overall assets are, 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 were massive then, they are still massive in all, uh, in all asset classes, from um, listed equities through to bank loan, loan books, through to the debt capital markets. Um, carbon intensive sectors are associated with a huge, a very large proportion of global securities. Um, there is huge amounts of evidence to suggest that these risks are not priced um, through research that people have been doing and also um, through practitioners that know that financial institutions don't really have a, much of a clue about how to price these risks appropriately and, and integrate them into their decision making. So I think the first two tests have, have, have definitely been met and, and I'm pretty sure we could have made that argument and we did make that argument convincingly in 2012. And the third, the third one I think has also now been met which is there is reasonable evidence to suggest that a subsequent correction might not happen smoothly. And it seems that um, scenario analysis and work that we've been doing in Oxford on missed emissions, but also other things that other people have been doing show that given the scale of the exposure um, and given the fact that these things aren't priced, it might be reasonable to assume that there is a risk that the correction might not be all. Um, so, so I'm very happy that the, the, the situation has moved on since, um, since Mervyn King's days at the Bank of England. Um, and it's also worth just, just saying that Carney, to his credit, when he joined the Bank of England in 2013, got this. And it's through that combination of his leadership, um, persistence from a great many people, um, some of which are in this room, um, and actually a bit of luck as well, um, which I can share with you over drinks later, um, that, that has resulted in this being picked up and run with by, by a variety of actors. Um, now, one of the reasons why this has got legs with other institutions and across the world um, is that people have seen how these risks and opportunities intersect with their responsibilities and their own interests. Um, and the relatively, um, I would say, and I think my friends and colleagues at the Bank of England would agree that some of the initial analysis was, given what we see now, relatively, relatively simple, rudimentary even, one could say, um, that, that actually the work has improved significantly, has become much more sophisticated. Um, and DNB, the Dutch Central Bank, has been first among other central banks in taking up this issue. Um, and, uh, and I think it's important to, to say that their latest work in this area has been world leading. The Dutch case um, is also particularly important, I think, for us when thinking about these risks, physical and transition risks related to climate change, because, of course, of their exposure um, to sea level risk and storm surges, uh, which is a function of and being low-lying and having a, a densely populated country, and we'll hear more about that, um, but also because of their large, sophisticated asset owners <coughs> and pension funds, and also their substantial financial services sector. Um, so I want to thank Frank for coming uh, here today to share that work, and um, hopefully other things they're planning to do. Um, it's greatly appreciated and, and very important. After Frank speaks, we're then going to hear from Freddie Otto, who is from Oxford at the ECI, the Deputy Director of the ECI, is going to respond, and then we'll open it up and take, take questions. Um, I'm not going to read through Frank's very impressive biography, but he's been Executive Director of DMB since 2011, and is responsible for pension fund supervision, supervision of horizontal functions and integrity, which I'm sure we'll talk about more about later, and legal services. He's also Director of the Dutch National Resolution Authority. So over to you, Frank. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, uh, for this uh, wonderful introduction. Not just of myself, but uh, much more importantly about this um, this very very um, important subject. 
Uh, I think uh, you've pre pretty much touched on all these subjects already, um, but I will um, try in the next uh, 30 minutes or so to, um, to, uh, to give you a couple of things that, that might be interesting. I hear that you are from many, many different backgrounds, which probably means that it is impossible to be interesting to any of you all the time, uh, but I will try to, uh, to make it um, uh, at least um, um, so entertaining that we get all the way to the drinks. Um, I think it is, um, um, for me, quite a pleasure uh, to be here at, uh, at Oxford um, and to be um, in front of such a wonderful audience. Uh, you're not just condemned to be an audience because, uh, as uh, Ben has already pointed out, uh, there is going to be a questions and answer um, um, session, so I really hope that, um, just, um, th 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 that you will uh, participate. Um, all right. Um, I think that um, there's one thing that Oxford and the Smith School and the Dutch Central Bank have in common, and that is that we are leverage organizations. And I will come back uh, to that word leverage um, in, in a minute. Um, I will discuss today three things. Uh, first of all, um, I think it might be interesting for you to just um, hear a little bit about the work that we have been doing at the Dutch, um, at the Dutch Central Bank. And, um, um, and I will focus on, on a couple of reports that we have done uh, last year and one that has just come out. And then I will take you uh, to the second subject that I would like to develop on, about, uh, that, that develop on a little bit, uh, which is the high level expert group on sustainable finance of the, um, of the EU. Um, I'm an observer to that group, um, but there are a couple of developments there that I think are useful for you to know and uh, you might even want to participate in the process that is uh, around that group. And then the third, uh, the third um, chapter maybe uh, of what I would like to mention is some of the developments um, uh, internationally uh, and then I will also come back to this word leverage. Uh, but I'll start uh, by talking a little bit about what we have been doing at the, um, the Dutch Central Bank. And in order to understand that, it's maybe useful for you to understand what we are. And we are a very, <laughs> what we call, integrated central bank and supervisory authority. Uh, so we supervise, uh, prudentially supervise, uh, the banking sector, the pension fund sector, the insurance sector uh, in the Netherlands, which, as Ben has already pointed out, are quite, um, quite oversized in, um, in, uh, in comparison to, uh, to, uh, relative to, uh, to the country. Um, and in addition to that, we are also a central bank participating in the European system of central banks um, um, and, um, and co-elaborating, um, um, uh, so to speak, uh, on, the, um, on making um, um, of uh, monetary policy. And indeed, we are also a national resolution authority, but um, we have tried to find angles for sustainability in all our tasks. I'll talk about that, but I must say that from the angle of the resolution authority, we have not found such an angle yet, but maybe uh, you have suggestions for that. Um, maybe it's also interesting for you to understand how come that a conservative institution as um, a central bank, and we have been around not as long as the Bank of England, but uh, a little bit more than two, um, two centuries now, how come that we have um, been able to, um, I don't know whether we are world leading, but uh, indeed we are very active in this field. And um, I thought that maybe a good way for you to understand is to take you to a stroll on the beach that we had as a newly um, appointed board, um, executive board, um, in um, the, the fall of 2011. And we had one of these offsides that we thought, you know, we want to talk about, uh, you know, what the mission statement of this bank should be, what is our, what's going to be our program in the next seven years, because our mandate is seven years. So we walked on this beach, and, um, and it was actually, um, uh, quite ironic because we were thinking about the horizon but we couldn't see it because it was a very dense fog but anyway in this very dense fog we were discussing amongst each other so what, what is what is our real mission and the mission statement the first sentence of the mission statement then read as follows I will read it to you DMB seeks to safeguard financial stability and thus um, contribute um, to prosperity in the Netherlands and that was already there and we added one word uh, we added the word sustainable so now it reads, DMB seeks to safeguard financial stability and thus contributes to sustainable prosperity in the Netherlands. Now it was not easy to agree on adding that one word. Um, actually, uh, we were five and, um, and I was only supported by one of the other board members at the time uh, when we were having that stroll. And the others were saying, well, but you know, we are not Greenpeace, uh, we are a central bank, um, uh, what do we have to do with all these things? 
And, but then we started thinking about what is, what is really the DNA in the core of what we do as a central bank and supervisor. And if you make monetary policy and you lower rates, now they probably cannot go lower, but then they could still, um, and you lower rates, then of course, you know, you give kind of like a, you know, a shot of energy to the economy. Um, but if you don't do that in a sustainable way, then, you know, that will fade away and, uh, you know, will, you will not have a sustainable monetary policy. If you have an insurance policy on, I don't know, on, on the fire of your house and you pay your payments for 30 years and then suddenly there is this fire, you want this insurance company to actually be able to, um, to, to, to pay you. And same for pension funds. So actually all the things that we do have to do with long term, long termism, extreme long term actually. Uh, so Talking about that, we came to this idea of sustainability. And then the years after that, um, we have been um, trying to actually give meaning to that word. And I remember that um, I was at a stakeholder meeting because back then in 2011, we already did things. We had a CSR report, we, did, uh, we had the regular nod in our in the annual report to sustainable issues, but these things actually had to do with ourselves. So we have an organization, 1700 FTE, and you know, we were very proud that we have diminished a little bit the CO2 footprint of each, and, uh, each of our, our employees. Um, and I remember I was at the stakeholder meeting and you know, very proudly talking about all this stuff and then somebody, somebody stood up from an NGO and said, well, Mr. Ellison, it's all very good and well, but this is not what you should be talking about. What you should be talking about is how you integrate this thinking in your key tasks. What do you do in your banking supervision? What do you do in, in the payments? Uh, and uh, the, what do you do in insurance and pension fund uh, supervision? And what do you actually do in monetary policy field in terms of sustainable thinking? Because now you have this mission and it is so much more than telling your, um, your co-workers to take the train to Frankfurt instead of flying. And um, you know, Sometimes you have somebody standing up, I hope that uh, some of you will do so later, and you s immediately understand that they are completely right. And um, so I told him, I said, you are completely right, so we need to change this. And, um, but that was a difficult thing to do, because um, you know, society might be skeptical, but you know, the inside of a central bank <laughs> is extremely skeptical. Um, so at the time, I was, um, I was um, in charge of um, payments. And that was a good thing, uh, because the others were not. Uh, so I could uh, pretty much do what I wanted to do there. And the good thing is that we produce, produce one real physical product, and these are banknotes. We don't actually produce them ourselves, but we procure them. But these, this is actually the only tangible product that a central bank actually makes. So I asked about you know, how sustainable are these banknotes. And um, they said, well, this is all very good, because 10% of the cotton, they're actually made of cotton, not of paper, uh, in uh, the, at least the euro bank notes, ten percent is sustainable because there are all these uh, these uh, these labels and all. I said, well, I want it to be hundred percent, and they looked at me saying, this is impossible. I said, well, I'm sure it's possible, but it will take some time. So actually, in 2019, we will get to the point that you know there's hundred percent um, sustainable cotton bank notes. All this is still not important for you. I understand that. However, it was important for us because we had made a change from thinking about our own employees to thinking in terms of our own tasks. And then um, a much more exciting journey started. And that was a journey of how can we then incorporate this in the supervision, in, um, in our economic research and in all the other things that we do. But I think there the mental change had been made and I think that was important. Um, to just give you an insight of an email in an email I got today, one of my um, uh, one of the person in the legal department said that he heard that within um, some quarters um, of uh, the, the, the the you know all the uh, all the committees, so to speak, that we have within the, the European Central Bank, some people are thinking about shouldn't we think in terms of sustainability also in terms of monetary policy? Now this is you know we don't like to, th to to even say this. That's why I was hesitating because we think it's very very far away from our mandate. However, some people think about this, and um, um, and that was absolutely unheard of. Um, uh, seven years ago. So you see this change uh, within these, um, what I said before, um, um, conservative organizations. Now what happened then, of course we had the Paris, uh, Paris Agreement, you know all about that, and we had indeed also the tragedy of the Horizon speech of uh, Mark Carney, which I think has really um, made a big impact uh, all over the world, but also within, um, within the Dutch Central Bank. Um, then 
um, I moved uh, within the executive board. Uh, we shoved around a little bit with the um, with the, the the responsibilities, and I became responsible about three and a half years ago. Um, 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 amongst other things, uh, for supervising the pension fund sector. So I thought if I could change the banknotes, why can I not do something with sustainability in terms of pension fund supervision? And um, um, and, 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 and Ben already said that the pension fund sector in the Netherlands, you might know, is really, uh, really big. Um, so I think it is about roughly two, um, two times um, the, um, the gross national product that we have actually saved there in, um, in, the, in the pension fund system. And me being a lawyer, I asked one of my colleagues, I said, well, could you maybe um, look for some legal basis for me to do something about sustainability in the, in the pension fund sector? And um, so this guy, he, 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 you know, he walks away and he starts reading the Pension Act and he comes back the next morning with Article 135, uh, Paragraph 4. Now, you are forgiven for having forgotten what um, Article 135, Paragraph 4 of the Dutch Pension Act said. Actually, at the time, I had no clue. But what it says is that uh, pension funds um, must um, um, uh, publish their uh, policies in terms of ESG investing on an annual basis. Um, so there is no legal requirement for them to actually invest in certain assets or not, but they must be transparent. It's just a regular transparency um, um, clause, but it um, focuses specifically on ESG. Um, so I thought that since we have discretionary power to use our um, our people to investigate whatever we want uh, to be investigated um, that um, we could actually uh, see how the pension funds in the Netherlands complied with that um, with that article um, and uh, because I wanted to make an impact on the pension fund uh, <coughs> sector, we didn't do what we normally do. We said, well, you know, we take like a sample of 10, three big ones, three small ones, and three uh, in between ones, and one more. And then, uh, you know, we do our research. So we had, uh, we just researched all. So these are 200 and uh, plus uh, pension funds. And we just all uh, asked them all to tell us what they did in terms of their reporting um, about um, ESG factors. Now, this has made a big impact. Um, it wasn't revolutionary, um, actually, if you think about it, um, but it was revolutionary for them to see that we as a regulator thought this was so important that in our own risk analysis we get to come to the point that we actually did do that assessment. Um, and then, of course, the question was how do we give back our findings? And, um, and since we didn't have a legal basis to actually tell them to do, um, to, you know, to disinvest here or to engage there, we thought that probably the way to have the most impact was to just publish a report in which we um, put a mirror to the sector and said this is what we saw um, and we went as far as to um, to categorize uh, good practices. We didn't we, we discussed best practices but we didn't dare to because we felt that you know we don't have the wisdom uh, but we gave good practices back to the sector and what we did we um, we spent um, some 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 space in that report on taking away perceived barriers because you will see when you talk to assessment to to to, to asset managers to anyone in the financial sector um, about this and they're still skeptical, they will say, well, there are too many barriers and, and many times the barrier is actually the financial regulator um, um, or the law and the regulator and the supervisor, all of them together. So we, um, so we, we, we took care to, um, to highlight some of these perceived barriers and explain that they were actually not there. Um, then that was our first report, that, uh, and that was, uh, I think, the beginning of last year. Um, in the course of last year, another report um, was done by our, our economic research department. Um, so there again, we were able to move from payments to pension fund supervision to economic research, which was even a more conservative nucleus, so to speak, within the organization. Uh, but we got them as far as to be able to, you know, to spend some, some resources on doing this research. Um, and this is important because our economy is highly uh, fossil fuel dependent. And some of the findings was that we called upon the government to come up um, with a long-term uh, policy vision on the transition to a CO2 neutral economy. And we urged them to come up with a climate law. And this was also, um, at least in, you know, in our quarters, rather revolutionary, that there was a central bank um, uh, prudential supervisor calling for a climate law. Um, but um, but we, we did. Um, 
because we felt that it was very important that government give a long-term vision and therefore long-term clarity um, to households and to enterprises uh, for them to be able to make a gradual and controlled um, adjustment avoiding excess excessive write-offs and losses. Um, and we are very glad to see that uh, we have now a new government. Uh, those of you who have followed uh, Dutch politics, I'm sure not all of you do all the time, but we have been without a government for about six, six months. Blessed is the country that survives such, uh, such a time. Um, anyway, and now we have a new government and they have actually come up um, with, uh, in their coalition accord. We always have coalitions, four parties this time. It's incredible what it is. Uh, and in this coalition accord, it says very clearly that there is going to be a climate law and there is actually going to be a um, climate um, a minister and in, in a cabinet member. Um, so um, I'm not um, 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 I'm, I'm not saying that that was just because we um, uh, we came up with that. Many others have pleaded, uh, pleaded for that, but indeed uh, it was a reaction that we liked um, to see. Um, some of the things that will be in there is that there is going to be a mandatory legal um, um, obligation to reduce emissions uh, by by half uh, by 2030. Uh, baseline being uh, 1990, I think it is. Um, there are um, um, uh, c absolute um, sums uh, being mentioned in terms of uh, the amount of um, investments that's going to be made by the central government. Uh, and there's even a, um, a plan to engage with the European uh, counterparts in order to, um, um, to strengthen the European emission norms as they, uh, as they stand now. Um, and there's also going to be changes in the tax code in order to make that greener. Um, coal uh, fired power plants, a very, um, very tough political issue in the Netherlands, um, are also going to be closed uh, by 2030. So there's a number of uh, policies that have now been adopted uh, that we are very glad, um, uh, glad about and that we think that are uh, very important. Um, all right, as a regulator, uh, we are increasingly scrutinizing um, how the institutions under our supervision uh, manage climate risks. I think that uh, Ben already mentioned that as well. Um, and not just how they deal with physical risks um, of climate change, but also the risk of the transition. And uh, the latest report that we uh, published uh, just a couple of weeks ago um, actually uh, analyzes um, some, of these, um, th some of these risks. <coughs> Um, including the consequences of climate change for the insurance industry, uh, the potential impact of severe flooding scenarios on the Dutch financial sector, the risk of holding carbon intensive investments um, are uh, some of the themes that we, um, that we uh, address in that, in that report. It's all also available on, also on uh, our website in English. It's called Waterproof uh, with a question mark, an exploration of climate related risk for the Dutch financial sector. Uh, and um, um, well, the, you're kindly invited, of course, to, um, to, to, to read that. Um, some of the highlights th that we came out uh, with in that report. Um, when it comes to managing physical climate risks, uh, the Dutch insurance um, in the industry is on the front line. Um, the potential impact of climate-related losses for the insurance industry was starkly highlighted in 2016 uh, following a severe hailstorm. Uh, and this hailstorm cost about 600 million uh, euro, and that, of course, as a number, it doesn't say much, but it was much more than um, than the risk models of these insurance uh, companies had actually uh, taken um, taken into consideration. So that was really a wake-up call for them that they should um, invest more in um, making more sophisticated their risk management systems in this um, in this field. Um, we have seen in um, our research has shown that in recent decades insurers have uh, indeed uh, significantly improved uh, their risk management uh, of weather related events. However, um, their models, because if you want to be sure about this, you have to really dive into their models, their models don't really look at trends. And also the um, models, what they actually did, the entire uh, sector actually used, they get from, um, I think it's only three uh, providers uh, internationally and um, and those have never actually looked at the specific circumstances in the Netherlands and um, so so um, and of course you know these are uh, idiosyncratic things and um, so that's one of the um, one of the recommendations that that's in the report that we tell our insurance sector to uh, to do more homework there um, 
One solution, uh, for example, is to make more use of a range of alternative risk estimates in catastrophic modeling. Um, now, I'm sure you're aware that um, uh, because I was talking about this 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 hail um, this hail storm, but um, you know, for a country that is for such a big percentage on the sea level, hail is maybe the least of our worries. Um, so we've also looked at um, at the risk of flooding, and. Um, well, you, as, as I said, we are, as a country, extremely vulnerable. Um, there is this, um, this, 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 uh, what we call uh, the Randstad conurbation, which is, you know, The Hague, Amsterdam, uh, Rotterdam, Utrecht all together. There's nine million people living there, um, and three quarters of our gross national product uh, being uh, being produced, and all that is pretty much either under sea level or at high risk if there um, if there were to be a a, a flood. Um, so, of course, many investments have been made uh, over, the, uh, over the decades in the Netherlands in order to protect us from the sea, as uh, you have here, uh, here in England as well. Um, but it took a big disaster to actually get these uh, investments going. And this was the big flood in 1953. Um, and I've learned in preparing for this, uh, this, uh, this speech that actually there was as big a flood here uh, in, uh, in England as it was, um, um, or in Britain, I should maybe say, um, as in the Netherlands. Uh, and that's one lesson I drew that, you know, that the history lessons are still too nationalistic because there's no one in Holland that actually knows that. So I just wanted to share that with you. Anyway, um, um, so yes, there are big investments being made in trying to protect us from flooding, uh, but um, that doesn't mean that the um, financial sector is off the hook. Um, all right, <coughs> let me see, because I want to not to take too much of your time. Let me go. Uh, um, through this. Maybe um, one um, example that I want to give you about the things that we looked at in this last report about transition risks. Um, because you are always in trouble. Either because there is no measures being taken by government and then you will be hit by fiscal risks um, because the climate will change. Or uh, government will take um, action and you are going to be at risk because of these actions. Um, so, um, so that's also one of the reasons why we think that it's so important that each and every um, um, uh, super the, the institution that we supervise um, does spend uh, much more time um, in their risk management because there is no one who can escape either by fiscal risk or by transition risk or by both. And I didn't even mention legal risk. So. Um, now, one a regulation that has come up in the Netherlands is that all office buildings um, need to have um, a C label or more or better on a scale I think from G which is very bad to A which is very good um, um, in terms of energy um, f the, the, the efficiency <laughs> by the 1st of January 2023. Um, so we thought why don't we ask our banks and the other institutions and see whether they actually know their exposure on um, these office buildings. Have they actually put in their, um, in their, their, their system, systems these various labels? Um, well, uh, I think half, half of uh, Dutch office buildings have now been categorized by the financial institutions that actually have exposures on these, uh, on these buildings. Uh, but they are now doing very fast their homework because we did this research and they realized by themselves that of course this couldn't be. The, the good thing is though, is that what you see is this wonderful interplay between a government policy, which is actually setting this deadline, um, and then the private sector uh, jumping um, on this um, on this risk, but also on this opportunity, because any own owner of such a building now, because they know in five six years time, it will not be able they will not be able to rent it out, so it will be practically uh, worthless or negative worth because you will have to uh, tear it down. Um, so what happens is that banks they actually go to those who gave that um, that building uh, as collateral. They say, well, you know, we will not. Um, renew our loan unless you make sure that your building is C, uh, C label um, uh, or better um, in by the 1st of January 2023. And, um, and then and the bank will ask, and do you have a plan? And many times, you know, the answer will be, I didn't know about this, no plan. The bank says, well, no problem, because I can help you out with this plan, because I have here this constructor, and we have a, you know, a joint venture together, and we can help you. So, so that is actually what is happening now. 
Um, and my point here is not to make you very knowledgeable about the Dutch real estate sector, but that to make sure that you understand that there is going to be many of these deadlines in the years to come in many of the jurisdictions that are relevant for us. Um, so people will, you know, in the end have to deal with the fact that by, you know, a certain deadline there will be, um, you know, there will be a clear prohibition of diesel cars. There will be a prohibition of fossil uh, cars. There might be a prohibition of fossil shipping. There, um, there, the, you know, coal and um, coal-fired plants will be taken out uh, by a certain deadline. So, um, and of course this could also be done by a much better and more sophisticated system of CO2 pricing, which our economists tell me all the time that is actually a much better way to do all this, but, um, and it probably is, but since we don't have that as of yet, you will see that as a second best, um, um, uh, the governments will uh, be finding and legislating upon these deadlines and it will make sure, uh, or it will, it will cause uh, for the financial sector to, um, to, to, to react. Um, all right. There's something else that we have done, because I've been talking about um, the various tasks that we have, statutory tasks, monetary policy, payments, uh, supervision, uh, resolution, if you like. Um, but we felt that, you know, we are also an institution, um, and abstracting a little bit from these specific tasks. And as an institution, we have convening power. Um, if I uh, invite some, uh, some, some organizations or some people to the Dutch Central Bank, they, all will, they always come. I don't know whether that is the same with the, uh, with the Smith School, I'm pretty sure it is, but it's also true with, a, with the Central Bank. So I was talking, um, this is about two and a half years ago, with uh, Simon Zadek. He works for the United Nations Environmental Program. Some of you might know him. And, um, and they had done just done their inquiry. So they had uh, gone through the world looking at all these various jurisdictions and see how financial and, and sustainable finance had developed. And I asked him about the, um, if you like, the policy infrastructure in these various jurisdictions. How does it work? And he said, well, there's, m there's many, many models. Sometimes it is the Ministry of Finance that takes the lead. Sometimes it is um, an academics. Sometimes it's the, um, the National Banking Association. And sometimes it is the Central Bank. And so my next question was, I said, well, did you find the, 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 the explanation why one model works in one country and the other works in the other? And then he looked at me and he fell silent. And then he looked at me more and he said, personal leadership and he just kept on staring at me so I felt that that was a message that he wanted to give me so somehow um, somehow I felt well maybe that is true maybe you can bring together um, people uh, by just um, by just doing that so um, we um, we founded what we now call the platform for sustainable finance in the Netherlands which brings um, together the National Association of, uh, of Bankers, Insurance Undertakings, Pension Funds uh, and investment firms, which brings together some of the uh, relevant uh, ministries, which is rather awkward that we in the central bank bring together also these ministries, but they come. Um, the Market Conduct um, um, uh, Supervisor Authority, our twin sister, so to speak, and um, um, a sustainable finance lab, which is an um, um, academic group uh, centered around the University of uh, Utrecht. So there we are, um, 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 the financial sector in all its aspects, in their, um, the, 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 the representative by, the represented by their umbrella organizations, ministries, uh, relevant ministries, Minister of Finance, Minister of Environment, now we're going to have a new Minister of the Climate, and, um, and I hope that he will be represented there as well, and um, the financial regulators plus academics. And there we try to come up with an agenda that helps to bring um, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 the sustainability agenda forward uh, within the Netherlands and I hope with the new um, uh, climate minister and the new climate law uh, that I can actually go to The Hague and say, well, you know, this is the financial sector, this is your national uh, strategic plan, this is how the financial sector can actually help to bring that about. Um, all right. Uh, what are we uh, doing um, and, and in addition to that, we are now also working on climate stress tests. Um, I think that, and Ben you know much more about this actually than I do probably, but um, I think that as mankind, if you like, we still have to learn much more how to actually um, 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 do our risk management in a good way. In this, um, in this high expert, le uh, expert group uh, on sustainable finance of the European Commission that I'm an <coughs> observer to, and I will go into in a second, um, but there is also this debate whether 
um, um, capital uh, charges should be um, should be uh, used for financial institutions um, looking at green or brown. And then our um, uh, saying that if you were to, for example, finance, I don't know, a windmill farm in Mexico, saying, well, that is a green thing, so then it's only fair because it's good for the world that um, you would have less of a capital charge uh, because of that being a green asset. Um, we are very much against that kind of reasoning. So, um, also in that expert group, um, my point um, has always been uh, to say, well, yes, all very good and well, but if you put 300 million in a windmill farm in Mexico and it goes past, then you have lost 300 million and, and there is 300 million of participants in the pension scheme. Um, so, um, if you have a certain amount of risk, there should be a certain amount of capital um, uh, that sits next to the risks. Um, however, Maybe, and that is actually the point I want to make, maybe we are not um, as uh, yet sufficiently sophisticated in how we measure those risks. Maybe we are underestimating um, the risk of brown and maybe uh, we don't understand um, all that there is to be understood about you know, the, uh, the changes that are coming up and that have a bearing on you know, how risky certain green assets are. So there I do believe that uh, when we get better at that and stress testing and scenario analysis is one of the tools that is available there and is being um, developed uh, in various quarters and will help us to actually do a better job in saying, you know, what, um, what, uh, what amount of risk is there really around a certain asset. And then, of course, once we know that with more certainty, then you know also the amount of capital that you need for that. Um, all right, I've been mentioning this, um, this high um, expert um, 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 uh, group on sustainable finance for a couple of times, and why do I think this is so important? This is important because the European Commission has decided that they really want to do something about the greening of um, uh, European financial law. And, um, and I'm just going to read two quotes to you, um, uh, one by one Vice President of the European Commission, Mr. Dombrovskis, and he says that the aim is to hardwire sustainability into EU financial policy. <coughs> and his colleague, also Vice President of the uh, European Commission, uh, Mr. Katainen, the two of them are sponsoring this, um, this process, says Europe needs to develop a proactive and coherent strategy to anchor sustainability in financial regulation and policy making. So the Commission means business and this group has been mandated for one year, so by the end of this year we have to come up with a comprehensive set of um, um, uh, the, 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 the recommendations in order to make sure that we actually hardwire sustainability in the financial uh, law in the EU. Um, it's a good group. There is people from various um, uh, market organizations, um, the London Stock Exchange, uh, someone from the University of Cambridge, and I don't know whether that is something that I can mention here, but it is true. But he comes from Bank of England, um, and but also various NGOs and others, and I'm an observer there, as I said before, and there's another thing that I've learned there, which I think is wonderful. The chair said, you know, we have some observers, but observers are here not to merely observe, but to make observations. So that's what I do there all the time, and that's why I mentioned this also to you because I think that if there is any ideas that you have and there has been a consultation document out there uh, since uh, since I think uh, late June or beginning of July please um, send in your comments uh, because the Commission is so keen on this is that um, on one of the recommendations that we put in our interim report which came out I think about one and a half months ago has already found its way in a Commission communication and uh, an annex to that communication our draft uh, draft laws um, 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 so what they do is that they are very keen on immediately taking up the recommendation of conflict. So if you want to really play a role in how the um, EU financial uh, law is going to be shaped um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the very immediate future, um, go to the website of the, uh, of the HLAC, the high, and, and high Level Expert Group on Sustainable Finance, and, um, and, and give your comments. Or what you can also do is you just send me an email, and if I think that is a very good thing, then I'll just, um, um, you know, I'll just uh, put it to the floor there and when I'm there in, in a couple of weeks' time again. Um, all right, that I wanted to say. Some of the recommendations, to just give you an idea of what this group is doing, 
um, is that we feel that there uh, is a need to develop a classification system for sustainable assets. The European um, Investment Bank is working on that, others are as well. Um, establishing a single European standard and label for green bonds and other sustainable assets. Um, strengthening of the ESG reporting requirements. Introducing a sustainability test for EU financial legislation. This is a very interesting one. It means that any time that the European Commission comes up with a draft um, legislative piece, it needs to go through a number of, um, of tests. Uh, and if those are not um, um, sustainable, this, you know, compliant with their sustainability strategy, then that law cannot, you know, go into the um, into the pipeline. Actually, I've been trying to um, to use this idea in the Netherlands and make it broader and say that actually we, uh, I think that this new coalition accord should have an SDG um, um, compliance test for any law that we will pass in the Netherlands. Uh, but uh, somehow they have not taken on board that idea yet. But maybe some other day. Um, and um, well, there's there, there we're also looking at the counting rules. And there's one uh, that I would uh, um, like to, uh, to to tell you about as well. Um, and then I think that I'm going to uh, get a little bit to the end. And that is that um, um, the idea of leverage. As I said, any pension fund. Um, beneficiary uh, can write to their pension fund and say, I think that sustainability is important. Uh, but then what is going to happen? If you are ABP, you're one of the biggest pension funds in the world and you have more than 200 million, oh, 2 million, sorry, 2 million or 3 million almost uh, participants, this one layer is not going to make a difference. If the um, trustees of this pension fund take a decision that they actually want to do something about sustainability, that makes a difference. If we at the Dutch Central Bank do an assessment of all Dutch pension funds, and we don't hit just you know one or two, but we hit them all. Uh, and uh, that has a lot of leverage. Uh, then, then we are talking about 1.2 trillion euros of um, money that can go from coal to windmills, if you like. Um, now, there's more leverage organizations. Um, the various, uh, the three. Uh, European supervisory uh, authorities, the uh, EBA, the IOPA and ESMA, they have leverage. Uh, so we felt uh, within this age lag that if we came up with a uh, with an, um, recommendation that it should be enacted in, Dutch, uh, in finan the EU financial law, that the mandates of these authorities that actually come up with policies for all the various um, uh, supervisory authorities in the, in the EU, um, that these mandates be more explicit in terms of um, 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 the sustainability concerns and risk management uh, for that matter, uh, then that would be double leverage because you would then having, uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the authorities would have leverage on the supervisory authorities in the various jurisdictions and they would then uh, reach out to their financial sectors. Another example of that is the IMF. I've been arguing, uh, but so far to no avail, uh, that also they uh, should um, should use their leverage. Uh, to just give you one example, um, one and a half years ago we had what they call an FSAP, uh, which is a financial sector assessment program, um, and that means that you know a team from the IMF comes into your organization. I think for may maybe you know the, the two weeks, and then they go away and they come back for another two weeks, something like that, and you know and they make a big report on, on everything that is uh, wrong and which is good in the Dutch financial sector, including uh, the regulator. So I was presented uh, with the draft report of this, uh, with this, uh, the, the, you know, this, this, this IMF group, and um, and and they asked me my opinion. I said, "Well, it's a wonderful report, but there's nothing, there's nothing about all that uh, we, I, have been doing about sustainability," and um, um, and that is um, slightly disappointing. And they said, "Well," uh, and I asked them, "Didn't you see? I mean, you've you know, you've talked to everyone," and they said, "Yeah, said, yeah we have seen it. It's wonderful, but it's not in our methodology." So I said, okay, so, so who is in charge of the methodology? Well, that is difficult. Um, but anyway, um, they said, well, there is one rule that we have, and that in the formal meeting in which we present this report, if somebody still raises a point, then we must bring it to our board. So I didn't, um, and I didn't advise in my, uh, or warn my, uh, my, my fellow board members, but at that formal meeting, uh, they actually um, you know, presented this report and there was almost wrap up time. And then I raised my hands and they were all looking at what does Frank Elson want to say? <laughs> and I raised this point. So now they have to actually bring it up to the board. So they are thinking about this, but um, my hope is that this FSAP methodology is going to be changed so that they, when, you know, whenever they go, well, because they, they go through the entire world, all the, um, all the important jurisdictions, and then they can actually you know, um, hold 
um, the supervisory authorities, the Ministry of Finance, the um, legislations um, to these criteria and I think that um, that is double leverage if ever there was one. All right, I think that um, my colleague Ingmar is going to be sad that I'm not going to be able to say everything here. There's one thing that I want to be mentioning, but not more than that, a fiduciary duty. A very important thing, very legal and very complicated and complicated for any lawyer and especially for a lawyer which is not from a common law um, a jurisdiction. Uh, but it is one of the things that we are discussing in the, uh, the high level expert group because it is obviously very important. There is a uh, Freshfields report, uh, you know, one of the, the, the big uh, main law firms um, of already 12 years ago that came to the conclusion that uh, integrating ESG considerations into investment analysis is clearly permissible and arguably required in all jurisdictions. This was already um, in 2005. There is another report um, which is called For This Year Duty in the 21st Century. Uh, two years ago, uh, which goes one step further and comes to the conclusion that actually there is a requirement to take this into uh, to account. What we will be doing in HLAC is try to convince the European Commission, I'll be, um, I'll be stopping, uh, the, the, to actually come up with what we call an omnibus directive, um, which uh, looks at I think at least five or six various directions where directives that are currently in place where there is language that has to do with fiduciary duty in order to, um, to make sure once and for all that it is not only um, prohibited to take into account sustainability uh, considerations, but that it is mandated, that it is a requirement that, um, that, um, that, that you do actually do so. So we hope to do away with one of the barriers that is um, uh, constantly invoked still, especially in the United States, by, uh, by trustees um, <coughs> in terms of um, them saying that they um, are not allowed uh, to take a long-term view, uh, whereas we think that they are um, actually um, required uh, to do so. All right, this was a very um, fast, broad overview, uh, as I said before, uh, knowing that you are from very big, uh, the, the, the big uh, array of, uh, of backgrounds. Uh, I'm sure there have been things that you already knew or that you certainly didn't want to know, but this is what I brought uh, to tell you, so I hope that um, it has been, um, it has been uh, useful to a certain extent. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Frank. And um, I think it's worth just bearing in mind that you know you've got one of Europe's most senior central bankers talking fluently about climate change. Not only that, he's also a catalyst for change on these issues in Europe but also internationally, and that's hugely impressive. And wasn't the case; we didn't have people like Frank doing this a few years ago. So it's a, it's a massive change in the system. Um, we're now going to hear from Freddie for about five minutes on attribution science, and we've talked a lot about physical risk and transition risk. Frank alluded to kind of liability risk and um, the developments that Freddie and Miles Allen and others have been doing in terms of probabilistic event attribution is really relevant to how um, what the, these, these regulatory issues go forward. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much. I will certainly not respond to everything that you've said because it's way broader than the things I'm focusing on. But you said one very important thing, and that is we need to understand risk and we need to work on understanding risk. And um, you also said that the physical, um, that when you have these hailstorm and that the insurers uh, realized that, that they actually have not had uh, any the, the risk of these kind of hailstorm anywhere in their portfolio and, and thought about that and um, they absolutely might be forgiven uh, I think because until uh, 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 yeah I would say five years ago or so um, whenever extreme events happened um, people were saying well we can't we can't attribute individual weather events to climate change that was one response that was given. Or the other response was, well, of course, climate change played a role because we're living in a, uh, in a world of climate change. Uh, so of course, these events happening in a world of climate change, which trivially is true, but it's also not very helpful if you want to estimate what, what are actually the risks of these kind of extreme weather events. And uh, what has happened in the last five years in the science world and in the development of the um, Event extreme event attribution is that we are now able for not for all types of extreme events but for many different types of extreme weather events to answer the question whether and to what extent anthropogenic climate change 
change the risk of the likelihood of these kinds of events to occur. Um, and a priori, there are always four possible outcomes of an attribution study like that. So it can be that climate change increased the risk, it can be that it decreased the risk, it can be that climate change did not change the likelihood of the event to occur, or it can be that with the current tools and understanding and data availability, we are not able to, to give the conclusive answer to this question. Um, but um, and the reason why this is not straight, the straightforward science and why you basically have to do it individually for, for all types of event on all parts of the world is that climate change basically has two impacts on extreme weather events. One is the so-called thermodynamic effect and that is well in a warming world uh, with a warmer atmosphere we expect the risk of heat waves to increase so we expect the risk of uh, cold waves to decrease and the warmer atmosphere can hold more water vapor so we expect on average um, the risk of extreme rainfall events to increase. But there is a second effect and that is the so-called dynamic effect uh, which is that in a, warm, in, a cha in a changing climate also the atmospheric composition changes so one of course is the uh, uh, greenhouse gases but then also just the different amount of water vapor in the atmosphere influences um, the atmospheric circulation and that means just where weather systems go and so uh, that can mean that in some cases you have that both these effects work in the same direction so you have um, that you have increased rainfall because of thermodynamic effect and at the same time you have more low pressure systems coming in that area so that also increases the rain so actually your risk of, of high extreme rainfall is increasing more than you would expect just from looking at the global average and just from looking at the thermodynamic uh, effect but in other areas you have that these two effects are cancelling each other out because they are actually working in different directions or you can have that while the thermodynamic effect would lead to more rainfall, actually if, if there is no rainfall systems coming in the area, then it won't rain. And so you actually have a decrease in the risk. And so this is something that um, insurers and risk modelers, they usually use just observed data as the basis of their risk modeling. And if you have a stationary climate that is not changing, that of course is, is no problem and it leads to a good assessment of the risk. But if you have a changing climate, then that might not in all cases be very helpful. And, uh, and not, it's important to say that definitely not all extreme events are becoming more likely or not extremely more likely, but there are some kinds of extreme events and some types of extreme events where climate change really is a game changer and makes an event orders of magnitude more likely. Heat waves in Europe, even in the Netherlands, for example, is, is one of these examples, which is heat wave in the Netherlands. There was no heat action plan. Heat wave just didn't exist. But suddenly it's something that exists and that actually has a lot of damages and, and financial implications. And so taking this <coughs> into account, into the risk modeling and into the risk assessment is something that is now possible, but it's just about. So the science really emerged over the last, yeah, I would say five years. So five years ago, there were, there were maybe three or four studies around the world on this kind of science, where now we have 140, um, but <coughs> it's still 140 of <laughs> the whole world. So we are still very, very far away from having an inventory of what are actually the impacts of climate change today. And then, of, cli of course, climate change is not stopping today, um, but there will be further warming in the future, and which then also needs to be factored in, into the success assessment. And we now have the tools and the scientific understanding to start to do that, but for it to actually happen, it needs people and institutions who, as you were saying, have the leverage, who have the power to say or to to force countries, institutions to actually do this kind of, of, uh, of analysis and provide inventories of what are the impacts of climate change today, estimate of what are the kinds of events where, where climate change is uh, an important player, 
but at the same time also to, to identify what are the events where climate change is maybe not playing an important role, which is as important. So one example is um, droughts in East Africa, where governments very happily say, oh, this is climate change. This, this, this is not something to do with, with anything that, mm -hmm. that, that, we can, that we can influence, that we can do about. But um, studies that have been done on these droughts suggest that actually climate change plays a very small role in the likelihood of these droughts to occur. But risk is not just a hazard. Risk is always a combination of the hazard and vulnerability and exposure. And if you understand that the hazard is actually changing in a very manageable way, then you can, you know, you can really uh, build your resilience and do something. And so this is why, um, why also negative attribution results are really important because they highlight what, what can be done and what, what cannot be done. And um, yeah, extreme events are always a good, um, a good point to start the conversation because they are very expensive, but they also then often open up political windows or, or just uh, yeah, possibilities to change things, to change law. And so, um, even if yeah, even if methodologies or rules don't exist or are not in in uh, yeah in a framework, picking up on something that has actually happened, and even even if it has is not one of the things where climate change played a really dramatic role, opens up to uh, take these kind of risk assessment and really trying to understand risks into account. Thank you. Thank you.